Hello and welcome back. This is Steven again. And in this video, we're going to use some tools that NiFi has available built into it to help evaluate our flow and how it's performing and where we might want to take opportunities to adjust it. So before we get started on that, uh, also just a quick reminder, uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider subscribing, especially if you find these videos helpful to you. Uh, when you subscribe, it helps me identify whether or not these videos truly are helpful and worth the time that I put into them. So if you haven't had a chance to do that, feel free to hit that button and uh, give that subscribe to the channel. And you'll also get the opportunity to uh, make it available so you can notify or have notifications sent to you so you know when the next video is released. So let's go ahead and take a look at our flow, the aviation data flow that we've been working on. And in the last video, we discussed are we designed out a second way to get to the same output we had, which was inserting our records or flow files into our SQL database and into our table. And in the first flow here on the left, we used the uh, JSON transform to get it done. We added an extra step in the middle of it. Normally we wouldn't need this, which was the split JSON. Actually, we, the split JSON is part of it. But from here, we split it off and had one split go over to the evaluate JSON path. So some people were, or I've been asked questions on, well, which way is better? Well, in my opinion, I like the left one and I actually have another way I can make this better. And we'll look at that in our next video when we expand on uh, taking this data and inserting it into a NoSQL database like say Elasticsearch. And that's what we'll do in that one. But so how do we evaluate our stuff here and how do we know how they're performing? So one thing we need to do is go ahead and trigger our trigger one flow file here and we'll stop it. Everything processed through and voila, they look pretty fast, don't they? I mean, it's hard to tell just by glancing it like that, which one was faster than the other. Especially when you look at the right side here, this right side, remember, starting from the split, we have three steps over here and we have four over here. So naturally we'd probably think this side's gonna be slower. And because we're taking, we're using an evaluate JSON path to put, a lot, to create a lot of additional attributes that just seem like they're slower to do things that way, or they cost us more in performance. Well, let's go ahead and take a look here. So let's go to our left side first with the jolt flow and go ahead and view, the, right click on it and say view data providence. And from here, let's just go ahead and take this top one and click on the info. And we can see we have a couple uh, timers in here that are going to be useful to us. So we have the event duration, and then we have what's called the lineage duration as well. So the lineage duration for this flow file, which is beginning to end, was 1.877 seconds. So keep that, remember that number, 1.877. Let's go ahead and take a look at the other side. And view data providence over here. Let's grab the last one here too. And this one for the lineage duration took 1.648 seconds. So they're pretty close. I mean, we're talking about milliseconds here. There, there's not much going on there, right? Even though one way seems longer than the other. But there's a couple other things we can look at too. So first thing, let's go ahead and stop these processors over here. And then stop these over here. So a couple other things that you'll want to pay attention to that will help you identify how you're using resources is to pay attention when we have the queue. So let's go ahead and trigger one more. Oh, I stopped everything on accident. <laughs> let's go ahead and get this one going. We want to use the split. So we can see right now that request, which we know comes back with 100 results in a JSON array, is taking up, let's zoom in a little bit more, uh, 82.03 kilobytes. And then from here, we put it into the split JSON. Gives us 100 flow files, both sides. We get the same amount moving in both directions, which is 81.67 kilobytes. Now here on the left side, we are going to go ahead and do this one. And the jolt, oh, dang it. I definitely hit the wrong button there, didn't I? 
Got to pay attention to which one I was clicking on. Okay, so let me just jump back there real quick. We want to stop here. Let me just use that shift there for a reason. Okay, that's good. Let's stop that one and then kick off a new one. Okay, so back to where we were. Jolt JSON, right? 81.67 going both directions. Now we're going to do or the split. Here's the jolt. And we're up to... We just took it from 81 down to 24.97. And the reason for that is because inside of our jolt, we're transforming the data or the flow files and the content inside of them. And we're basically trimming out a lot of stuff we don't need or that I don't want to carry forward. Now, let's go ahead and go over here. We have two extra steps here that are needed to accomplish the same thing we're getting done with the jolt. So over here, we go from 81.67 we start that one. Still the same amount, right? It didn't really do anything different here. One of our full files, we're still at 81.67. We go to the next step. And we trimmed out some stuff because all we're doing from here, so this one evaluated the JSON pass, put them into attributes, sent them down here into the next step. And then from here, those same attributes were written down into the content of the flow file. Now you may be thinking, well, that's weird. So now we've caught up to the other side, but we have 39.86 kilobytes. And over here, we only have 24.97. So one thing to keep in mind over here when we look at this is in this queue, these that went the jolt process, they don't have attributes for anything that's not needed just what we've had so far. So they didn't get an attribute for each one of the, the uh, fields that we, the key value fields that we have for the uh, other side for the content. Over here though, we do. So even though they process through the attribute to JSON, we'll go ahead and look at this queue because it is a bigger queue now. And if we search through the attributes, we see that even though we wrote those attributes to the content of the flow file now, the attributes themselves do not go away. So they're still taking up the same amount of resources they took up before we got to this step. So by the time we get down to the convert JSON to SQL step, our right side is actually performing kind of on par-ish with the left side when it comes to the duration of a, of a flow file from beginning to end. But when it comes to resources that are being consumed, we're consuming 24, 25-ish over here, and we're consuming 39-ish, 40 over here. So almost a good 15 kilowatt difference there, right? So that's what we want to pay attention to when we're building out our flows and how it may not look like going this route, which is a little bit more work in my opinion, because uh, you have to populating all of these is just tedious work <laughs> uh, to put all those uh, attributes in there. Where on the left side, once you understand how to do Jolt, it becomes kind of, there's some frustrating parts here and there, but uh, you keep learning from it and uh, you can accomplish a lot with that Jolt. And sometimes it can be intensive depending on what you're doing, but in this case, it's not. And it's taking up less resources to when we have our overall flow files and we're moving them through. And then same thing, next step, doesn't really change anything. Now we're at 33.79 and 19.53, and that's it. So they're both done, and that allowed us to observe the flow files as they were flowing through and see how they were using up resources when it came to memory and hard drive space and how the timing was between the, the lineage duration for the start, the creation of that flow file all the way down to when it was dropped and we finished using it. So there's a couple, a couple other things we can use. First of all, let's uh, go ahead and add a step in here. We're going to use a control rate. And this control rate is going to give us the ability to, first of all, spam our, <laughs> our response that we get out of the API. So we'll take the original here. Oh, no, my bad. Not the original. Uh, stop that. Okay, so what we want to do is take the response from here, send it up here, 
move that off to the side a little bit, give it another one, clean it up, just so we can keep track of it. There, whoops. There you go. Okay, nothing too pretty. So every time we get a response, it's going to send it up here. The other thing we want to do is we want to take a success and route it onto itself. So now we can go ahead and bring this guy down. So what's that mean? It means if I have one flow file coming here, and then I have it coming back out of here to the next step. So the response normally goes to the split JSON. So we'll do that, some the success over there. Get that out of our way so we can see things. Okay, so there we go. Won't mess with that. So now, the response comes out of the API, or the, the invoke HTTP, and we send a copy of that up to control for the control rate. And then from there, based off the properties we set there, it will forward that on through to success and then go to the next step that it was intended for, which was the split JSON. But at the same time, we're basically taking a copy of it, of that success, and routing it back onto itself. For a relationship and the reason is this basically gives us a duplicate and it keeps going and going and going now let's go ahead and get this one configured here flow file count uh duration zero sec whoops and that's all we need oh wait nope we need one okay can't have a time duration uh one second right okay Oh, failure, we didn't terminate that one. Okay, so this one's all ready to go. We'll go ahead and start that there. And the goal of, the goal of this is to simulate like a lot of flow files if we were hitting this up much more often. So we can put a little bit more stress on our flows and see where we, we might have issues. Uh, now this might be really aggressive on it, so we'll have to find out too, but it'll give us, it'll generate some extra data that's nice to have as well. Uh, okay, so that one's ready. Let's just get one here, relationship original. Yeah, I messed that one up. Let's go ahead and terminate that one again. And we can start this one. There we go. So the one went down like normal and followed through those flows. And we have another one now. I'm go ahead and stop this real quick. Actually, we can bump this one up too. Maximum is 10. I'll just do that. We'll get some in the queue here. Stop this real quick. All right, so this should start building things up. See, we already have 20 over here. Got that one, it just keeps flowing on through there. 50 over here now, okay. So now we can go ahead and just let this thing go wild. Pay attention to our flows and see what happens. All right, so we got some stuff being built up in the queue now. Trying to keep up, we see where thing queues are filling up, how they're doing. Granted, one bottleneck will probably be our SQL or uh, my SQL server, depending on how we have that set up. Which is right now doing batches of one hundred into the server at once, and they're both feeding off the same one, so we could always have issues. They're going to the same table, but look. <laughs> They're usually keeping up right now. So let's go ahead and uh, stop this one a lot more and let it build up some more. Now, another tool that you can use is, let's go ahead and take a look at this one here. So we have the, uh, when we right click on a processor, we have view status history. And in here we can see the drop down shows us in five minute, five minute uh, time spans, the information on this processor the start range and end range of the data. And then NIFI, so this is our min, max, and medium. And if we were in a cluster, then we would have a checkbox for each one of the nodes in our cluster. In this case, we're doing single node, so uh, there is nothing else. 
And what that means, we'd also have a graph being charted for each one of those. So we can see where that's being done. We can zoom in here a little bit too. We can drag and drop and or drag and stretch that over. See how it's doing. So in five minute intervals, we're processing up to, we have flow files out in five minute time spans. So uh, we haven't hit a thousand yet. Nope, 700. So we haven't got up that high on this processor at least. But we also have some other ones that are kind of nice too. So maybe average lineage duration. So inside this processor, the average lineage duration for those. Now keeping in mind that we're pausing things up a little bit. So lineage is being counted because it was created here. So let's go ahead and just let that go again. But these gives us this gives us tools to, to be able to check our flows and see how they're going. So over here, we haven't backed up our queue. We don't have an overflow, but over on the right side, the evaluation is actually taking longer when we put it under more stress. Now down below on the left side, it has started to back up now. So the SQL server is starting to become a problem, right? Both sides are trying to push files into it. And how often is this running? Oh, okay. So every opportunity it has, it's going to push files in there. But we saw the right side back up. It has a bottleneck here where we have this queue open in between these two, where over here it's just building up because it started down here and it's starting to build up backwards, going back to the top, right? So, and now we see things heaping up. It's found itself a little groove here now. And yep, still really this split going into this evaluate JSON path, this processor with only one thread available to it is where we're getting our bottleneck on this side even though they're maintaining close to the same lineage time right so stuff like this you can use to help you evaluate whether or not the flow you have right now because because as we've seen already right there's multiple ways to go about you can go about creating a flow where there might be better ways of doing this and i have another way that we'll use in our next video which will We'll split it off to the side and we'll see a little bit different way of doing it and it may perform better it may not we'd have to evaluate it and see what it looks like afterwards but here we go and i mean there are some ways to make it run faster right we could just say oh this one's having a hard time keeping up it's only running with one concurrent task at a time so we could multiply that a little bit more keeping in mind that when we do that we could get instability in the processor depending on how that processor is performing uh, or we eventually will start having problems on the server because we're consuming more and more resources available to the entire to our hardware on our server so we're going to be able to bounce that out a little bit so you need to do if you need to multiply this or not in order to keep up like down here on these put statements we could i mean this side's finally getting backed up because the server's not keeping up Although, keeping in mind, having multiple things right into the same, depending on the server and the architecture and stuff, like it may not be a good idea to have multiple concurrent tasks writing into the same table and server at the same time, right? I mean, we know about those type of issues, so we want to be careful. Let's get this one cleaned up. Let's go ahead and stop this one because it's done its part. Okay, there it is. So it, we already have a thousand backed up there. And let's go ahead and dump this stuff oops, into the database. So there you go. It's trying to use up, up to 10 as maximum limit now. And now it's just running concurrent tasks. Although it's all going to the same table. So it could have conflicts and collisions with the resources to write. Table locks and stuff like that are possible depending on the servers that you're using. Same thing over here, let's just turn this one back on so it can clean up and get itself back to zero. And then I think that's it for this video. In our next video, we'll go ahead and cover our next flow, our extension of this flow for the aviation data and we'll extend it. And we're gonna work on writing it into Elasticsearch so that you can see how you set that up and what you need to do for it and some considerations you'll need as well. So. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below and I'll catch you in the next one.